cross You died and rose again oh my God, I only ever do my own
We're here for you, Jesus. You alone, Lord Jesus. Let's sing it loud. Let our praise. Let our praise.
worshiping this morning, I feel the Spirit of the Lord say, as the children of Israel went through the wilderness, when they were in that dry and that hot place, they had needs and they had longings, and I know in my spirit there are those you can hear this morning, and you feel like you're in that wilderness, you've been hurt, or you've been offended, or you have a desperate need in your life, or you have a longing that's unsatisfied, the Lord says in the wilderness, He sees overshadow them, that his manna would fall fresh every day, that the cloud brought refreshing and it brought sanct- uh, deliverance from the, from the heat and from the uh, oppression of the, of the sun and the situation that they was in. And I feel the Lord saying this morning that his spirit overshadows this place like the cloud in the wilderness. You can have refreshing this morning. You can have fresh manna this morning. You can have deliverance in every need in your life. Because the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over us this morning. He is welcomed here with His praise. And now in His, his presence comes, He pours out from Himself. And He says this morning, come and receive from me. I have all that you need. I have all that you want. And I give freely to you this morning. Let then him that have need come and ask. And God shall fill every need. Father, we praise you in Jesus' name.
ask the ushers to come forward now and take the offering. money out of our hearts, out of the depths of our hearts, out of gratitude. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us in our lives, and we just thank you that we can, that we are able to give to you. Thank you for everything that you've provided for us. You are our provider, Jehovah provider, and we continue to give out of, out of gratitude and not out of, um, not holding back at all. Just use this money to your honor and glory.
never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Stage and toddlers are dismissed. Wow, thank you, worship team. That was just awesome. Good morning. You know, when I was in the States uh, one, this past summer, I was sitting there one evening, and, and I just wasn't feeling too special. I just asked the Lord, I said, am I really special to you, Lord? And I didn't hear nothing right away. Then uh, a little bit later, I looked over at Rachel. She was sitting across the way, and she had a rough day. She, wasn't, she, she had a lot of uh, work trying to that day. It was just a hard day for her, and, and I was sitting there at the computer, and I just turned the screen over towards her, and there was a picture on there. Maybe you could put that up here. And that picture just changed her countenance totally, from being all tired to just being joyful and happy, and it just, uh, just her face just lit right up. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, that's how I feel about you. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I just want to tell you this morning, you're special. And whether you feel it or not, it doesn't really matter, but you are. You know, when I'm over there with the Sunday school kids this morning, and I'm just looking at them, and it's not hard for me to imagine how, God, how precious they are to the Lord, and how God just adores them, and how He values them. That's not hard for me at all. Because I feel that way too. But when it's ourselves, sometimes we struggle with that, don't we? We know it to be the case from what the Bible says. We read it, and we know that he just is passionate about us. But yet sometimes we don't feel that way, do we? Now, I got a verse here in Jeremiah. Passage, I should say. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send, to, send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So we see by this verse, now a lot of you might know the story of Jeremiah, and, and he didn't have an easy life, but he had a purpose in life. And that purpose was set forth even before he was born. The Lord said, I, made, I created you just as I wanted you for a purpose in this life. And I created you to speak to the nations and to the kings of the nations, and I'm going to speak through you, 
I'm going to speak the words. When you get in front of people, I will speak the words that come out of your mouth will be my words. And so, God, we see here very clearly that God said he will rescue him too. Don't be afraid. I will rescue you, he said. So we see very clearly that every one of us is made for a purpose. God created us as he wanted us. There's no mistakes. There's no uh, defects. God doesn't make defects. He created us as he wanted us. For a purpose in this life. So it's not hard to see why we would be special to him. Because he, he, he knew us before we were born. He uh, had an arc, an arc, uh, I should say, a, a blueprint of us. He made every detail just as he wanted it. Luke 12, 6 and 7 says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you are more, worth more than many sparrows. So he has the hairs on your head numbered. Now, if he has my number, he knows they're decreasing every year. As, our, as many of us could say. But uh, he knows us so intricately, he knows every small, tiny detail about us. In Psalms 139, 13 to 16, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me, All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You know, if we believe that, I think if we even get a small revelation of the truth in that, it changes the way we live life. We don't live life trying to get significance from everything else, from other people. We don't live life trying to be special because we're better than others. We don't live life trying to be special because someone else loves us. We have value because our Creator put a value on us. And when that really sinks into the depth of our being that we're valuable to him. You know, it doesn't really matter what other people think. We just don't care that much. What other people think because we care what God, we know what God thinks of us, and that just so overpowers everything else, it just doesn't matter. There's such a security in resting in God's love. Now, we read the first passage about Jeremiah, and it said, I will rescue you, he told Jeremiah. Now, some of you may remember him being thrown into a well <laughs> and sunk deep into the mud, and he was left to starve there. And uh, it took 30 men to pull him out because the Lord sent them to rescue him and pull him out. doesn't mean he had an easy life. Jeremiah had a very hard life. There's no guarantee we'll have an easy life. But did God, was God true to his word with Jeremiah? Absolutely. So if we're so special to God, but we don't feel that way, what is the problem that we don't, why is it that we don't feel that way? If if you find yourself feeling like you're nobody, like you're not special to anybody, like you have no value, I think we've all felt that way at times. If you find yourself feeling that way, what is is, uh, causing that? Why can't we believe what God says in that regard? Well, there could be many reasons. One, we may have bought the lies from the enemy. Now, if you're a young child and you first go to school, how many here know that if there's something different about you, you will hear it? (laughs) If there's anything that sticks out, stands out about you, kids can be a little cruel sometimes, right? I remember when I was young and in school and and uh, somebody said I had a big nose, you know. 
So I'm looking in the mirror, and I never knew, knew I did till that other kid told me it, you know. I realized he's right. I do have a big nose, you know. And so I was sensitive from that point on about the size of my nose. Now, I think I grew into it a little bit over the years, but not necessarily. <laughs> then another kid said I had, uh, uh, I had wavy hair when I was young. You wouldn't know it now, but I, I, I grew into that too. But, but uh, I had wavy hair, and, and so somebody mentioned that and laughed about it. And so I remember after taking a shower at night, putting a beanie cap on my hair when I went to bed so when I'd wake up in the morning, it'd be all flat and straight, you know. And I thought that looked better. You know, it's just funny how kids hear something and they, they buy that, you know. And so the world's been telling you things all since you were young. The world's been telling you that you are nobody. They've been telling you many things about yourself that you've probably believed and bought that lie. Now, for some, you may have been extra talented in a certain area, and you may have overcome that because of being so good at something. You may have done something better than everybody else, and so because of that, you felt significant. Uh, I hate to tell you, but that's a cheap substitute for what God wants for you, okay? That, that's not the way God chooses to overcome that in you. Now, for those that haven't been overwhelming in some way. Maybe they were uh, popular because they were attractive or something. I don't know. It could be anything in your life that may have helped you overcome that. But again, it's a cheap substitute for what God wants for you. He wants you to take your significance in the fact that you are special to God. And because of that, it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Now, there's a second reason that we may not feel that. And this this will take a little bit of a shift here. So don't forget what we've been talking about, that you are special. But we can come to dislike ourselves. I've heard it called loathing ourselves because it's such a deep inward dislike that we do, we can develop for ourselves. And, you know, this can start Again, when we're a little child, if parents don't do the job that they've been uh, given by God to do for their children, that's correcting them and punishing them when they're wrong. Guilt builds up in a child. And if he doesn't get punished for it, that guilt just continues to build up. And after a bit, he doesn't love himself anymore. He doesn't like himself, really. And how many know that if you don't like yourself, you can't like anybody else either? It's just a fact. You have to love yourself before you can truly love someone else. And so a child can turn into a hellion if he's not disciplined. If he's just left go, and he, that guilt builds up and gets over, so overpowering in him, he doesn't like himself, and he, and he just makes everybody else miserable too. You've probably seen this in... in uh, Parenting like when one of your kids is really being having a bad hair day and they're making sure everybody else does too and you have to take them and you have to uh, apply the rod. And after that, they cry for a while, but after that they're so happy. And they're even hugging you and they're being so good and sweet and kind and you, and you wonder now, how did that change from this to that except they were cleansed of their guilt? Now when we're little kids, that's a parent's job to do that, Right? But as we get older, that transfer from, transfers from our parents to God. We, we go directly to God. We repent. We're, we realize what we've been doing. We realize we've done wrong things. And we cry out to God and thank him for forgiving us. And he floods us with that, that uh, uh, joy of being forgiven, that, that, that cleansing that we need. And then we're just like that little kid. We're all happy and, and we're, we're joyous again and we, and we can love others, you know. But if we aren't in the habit of doing that, or worse yet, if we justify things we've been doing wrong, we kind of justify them, well, they do that, or oh, well, they did it to me first, or whatever it might be, if you justify that, well, everybody else my age does that too. Um, whatever it might be, then you don't go to God, you don't get cleansed of the guilt 
of what you've done. And so it builds up in you. And you get a dislike for yourself that doesn't go away just by wishing it so. Now I'm going to talk about one area, and it may seem to be a change. Or maybe you can't link these two very easily, but but the Lord showed me that they are linked. And it's getting offended. Now it says, uh, verse Matthew 24.10 says, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This is talking about the last days. And it says that, uh, that in the last days, many will become offended. We will, we will struggle with offense. And that is, John Bevere has a whole uh, series on this. We actually go in depth in this in, uh, in LCI because it's such a powerful thing that if, if we don't understand this, this deals with forgiveness. It's the center of the gospel. If we miss this, we've missed something too powerful to be victorious in life. And he says that the word for offense in the Bible is the, the word Greek word scandalon, which actually means trap. And he goes on to show how it's a trap of the enemy to get you to take an offense, to pick up offense for somebody. Somebody says something to you, and it hurts because maybe they meant it that way, or maybe they didn't. But it hurts, and we're tempted to latch on to that and take offense in it. Now, there's a progression here it talks about when it says this. It's a specific progression. It says, many shall be offended, shall betray one another, and, and shall hate one another. It starts off, an offense starts off just with a hurt. Somebody said something, somebody done something, somebody cheated you, somebody uh, uh, didn't act the way you wanted them to to you, and you get offended. Now, at that point, it's, it's not so hard to reject that. You simply have to realize that, you know, I, I, I usually, myself, I say, well, you know, they, they didn't mean it that way. I'm sure they didn't. And inside, I kind of think, you know, if they really want to offend me, they're going to have to try harder than that. Because it's, I'm, I'm not going to get offended over some little thing. Uh, I'll assume that they meant the best when, with whatever they said. But if we don't reject it at that point, and we let that come into our lives, that offense, it will turn into what we call bitterness. It will make you bitter at that person. And when you, when you have a bitterness towards somebody you no longer can see any good in them. It, it obscures the good in them and magnifies the bad, the things that they, that they, are, that they may not be good at. Um, it, it distorts them in your eyes. If you, don't do, if you don't take care of it at that time and it progresses further, it'll turn into hatred. Now, hatred no longer even seeks reconciliation. Hatred wants bad to happen to that person. It's actually a judgment on that person where you actually, uh, when you hate somebody, you'd, you'd like to see something bad happen to them to make them pay for what they've, how they've hurt you. So it's a, it's a serious progression here that happens. And it says in the last days, this is the way the devil's going to trap us. He's going to put bait out there and for Christians to grab a hold of and it'll take them down that path, a path that they don't realize they're even going down. So what's some signs that we're offended? If something keeps coming up in your mind that somebody said, and, you, and it hurts when you think about it, and you, you, you are, uh, your opinion of them is lowering every time you think about it, you're on that road to being offended. If you meet a person at the store or the restaurant or somewhere... And you see them, and immediately you get some feelings inside, some emotional things happen in there, a hurt or anger or resentment or whatever it might be. That's a sign that you've picked up that bait. And what you do with it at that point 
determines whether you'll progress to bitterness and maybe even to hatred or whether you'll let that go. Now, most people, when they're just offended, they still hope that there can be reconciliation. They still, they still want to be reconciled to that person. They want, to, they want that person to come and say, hey, I'm sorry, I really didn't mean it that way if I hurt you. And they want to be reunited as, as the relationship. They want the relationship to be healed. At that point, they still do. But, you know, when you, when, when, if you continue down that road to bitterness, there's a point where you no longer want reconciliation. You want that person out of your life. You want them far from you as possible. And you don't want to even think that, about them in your mind anymore. You want them to... It, it, the, the, the anguish that happens inside of you is something you want to avoid. You don't even want to think about. At that point you have a serious problem with unforgiveness. And, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to say this, but if we don't make, if we can't make forgiveness work in our own lives, we've missed the point of the gospel. Because if the gospel's about anything, it's about forgiveness. And we've forgotten what we've been forgiven of. Anytime someone tells me they can't forgive, I ask the Lord to show them what they've been forgiven of. There's no greater way to be healed of that than to know what what the Lord's forgiven you of. We read in the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matthew 18, verse 34, And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. He's talking about the, um, the, the one who, wouldn't, uh, who had been forgiven the great debt and wouldn't forgive someone who owed him a small amount. And, and uh, so when that, the person who had forgiven him of much had said, and his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the tortures until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. That's very strong words. Very strong. But Jesus could say that because of the price he paid to forgive you of your sins. Forgiveness is only the beginning. What God really desires of us is reconciliation. When it's not always possible, there's 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 people that have hurt us or that we've hurt or whatever, that that don't desire reconciliation. There's little we can do sometimes to make that happen. But our goal should never just be forgiveness, but full reconciliation. In fact, you can love somebody greater after reconciliation than you did before. It's easy to love someone you hardly know. But, you know, when they step on your toes and they hurt you, and then you get reconciliation. Now you know their faults. You know what they're capable of. But you can still love them with a greater intensity because of what the Lord's done in you, enabling you to forgive and cleansing you from that. So our, our goal should always be a full reconciliation. It says in Matthew five twenty three. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. It may sound like I've jumped from several different things, but but let me tell you, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, if you're harboring an offense... If you're struggling in that area, you won't love yourself. I can tell you. It's very hard for you to feel good about yourself when you're harboring something that, uh, that, that comes from Satan. And it's hard to feel special to God. It's hard to feel what he says is true in your life if you're allowing something like that to remain in your life. Now, I want to say right now that if you feel conviction about something. One of these verses uh, brought conviction into your life. That's the Lord, and he's reaching down his hand like this, not with a, 
I don't even think with a hurt face. He's just saying, come, let me help you get through this. Let me help you. He's, he's always giving you a hand up. But if you feel condemnation, that's not coming from the Lord. Okay? We know where condemnation comes from, and that's, that's the devil trying to put you under his feet. But what does the Bible say? That he's under our feet. So beware of that. Don't let the devil give you condemnation on something. Don't allow him to put that into your life. That's, that, that's just as bad as anything else that he wants to uh, defeat you with is that condemnation. But if you feel conviction about something, that's the Lord saying, let me help you with that. And, you know, we, we can only forgive with his help. We, we can't do that in the flesh. It's not, it's not something we're capable of. Our flesh isn't capable of doing that without his help. So allow the Lord this morning, if, if that's something that's, that, that's uh, been spoken to you in your heart, allow him to help you in that area. Go to the person that he brings to mind and ask them for forgiveness. Do whatever it takes to reconcile with that person. You'll be so glad you did. You know, when, when, uh, when you're clean and cleansed inside, when you have no... When, when you can stand before God and say, you know, there's nothing I'm being convicted of right now. It's such an awesome feeling to be clean before the Lord. And, you know, that's when we really feel special. We may know it, but we don't really feel it until we're clean before God. And we can say, wow, that's an awesome feeling to know that he adores me, that, he, that I'm precious in his sight, that, that he just loves. When he sees me, it's like, my wife seeing our grandchild and all the feelings that well up in her and the, the happiness and the, just the love she feels, that's what he feels for us. And I can believe that when I'm feeling cleansed inside, when I'm feeling clean. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we hear the words that you've spoken. Father, I, you know I didn't necessarily want to go there. This morning, but Father, I felt you're, you're prodding to go there. So I'm sure someone here is feeling that this morning, that, that those words were for them. So Father, I just ask now that they wouldn't feel condemnation, that there'd be no condemnation uh, put upon them, but only conviction and a hand from you saying, let me help you. Father, we know you not only give us the desire to change, but you give us the ability Father, so we ask this morning, Father, that if, if uh, also if anyone doesn't feel special this morning, Lord, that you would just give them them feelings, Father, that go along with the knowledge that they are special. You love them, Father. You created them for a purpose, a purpose that they can only see a small part of right now, but that will just blossom in their future. We thank you, Lord, and we adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Very well. Thank you for coming. Are there any announcements that need to be Who's new here this morning? First time visit. Let me see your hands, please.